RGG represents young, in young people, presents in young people quickly and intensely. And a key point for clinicians to know, usually after an extended amount of time spent online. It's the most common kind of factor that you hear about. And it seems to be the result of social contagion and or emotional distress. For example, in the UK, there's been a 5,337% rise in the numbers of female children presenting at the Tavistock. And so if you look at these two graphs, you'll see what is historically children who had gender-related distress were very small in number, were like people like myself, and it presented young. So for me, it goes back to as far as back as I can go. So that'd be about the age of three. And it's very intense and it, it's very loud. I remember Ken Zucker, who I hope is here. I know he registered today. I remember he said, you know, when, when a child presents as, you know, with gender dysphoria, the town knows it. It's loud, if you follow me. While ROGD seems to be a different phenomenon, it's not very young children. These are post-puberty and um, it's generally after a long time online and there generally seems to be some level of trauma attached. And you can see the numbers shot up as we became more online um, in, the, in the teens from 20, kind of 2012, 2013 onwards, it shot up fast. And if you look at the second graph, you will see that uh, it shot up and girls suddenly presented. So historically, it was much more common among boys. I know I'm a girl, but it was much, much more common among boys. And there was two major cohorts. There was young children who are boys most often and or middle-aged men. And suddenly out of nowhere, Adolescent girls came in and came in very fast in uh, kind of between 2012 to 2021. And it's an extraordinary change in the demographic. And not only that, their personality, their kind of their life experiences has changed. These are stats I've taken from Dr. Littman's study. 43% had a history of being isolated from their peers. 45% were engaging in self-harm prior to the OROGD kind of presentation. 48% had experienced a traumatic or stressful event prior to presenting with ROGD. 63% had other diagnoses such as psychiatric disorders or neurodevelopmental disabilities. And so if you're a clinician working with this, you need to be aware of these facts so that you can work and be at your best and present so that you're not seeing gender dysphoria as an encapsulation condition. And you're aware 63% with rapid onset gender dysphoria that's presenting adolescents might have a psychiatric disorder. Certainly they did in this, in this study, a psychiatric disorder or a neurodevelopmental disability. That would be things like ASD, ADHD, anxiety, eating disorders, OCD, and then 69% had social anxiety during adolescence. This is a vulnerable group. This is a very vulnerable group of young people. And so if you look at this, this is the common sequence of events for ROGD to be announced. Sometimes it's following a traumatic event. It's pretty much always after um, an extended amount of time spent online. Then the young person very often, not always, but very often identifies as gay, lesbian or bi. And then after they've identified as that or some level of queer, um, they announce their transgender identification. Very, very often this gender dysphoria that they, they kind of proclaim will be self-diagnosed and it'll be via internet influences. They often know somebody either in real, real life or online or from TV. They know somebody who has come out of, as trans and they are often very besotted with the kind of the trans politics, the trans kind of world, because it is very alluring. There's almost nothing more alluring in life than for somebody to say, you can be somebody different. You can be somebody different with a new name, a new identity, and you can get rid of the old identity and you can be a completely new person. For parents, gender dysphoria often feels like another diagnosis at the end of a long list. And we'll be hearing from our parent campaigner after me. Um, some common features in ROGD youth, they're often quirky. They're very likable, socially awkward, intelligent. I knew them as a teenager, you knew them as a teenager, that clever, quirky person, naive, vulnerable, very often heightened sensitivity and emotionality, hypervigilance around gender issues, very often online self-diagnosis and online influences, a politicized understanding of gender that would never have presented pre-2012 or so. A very much what's commonly I've noted as a clinician, and I work a lot in this field these days, 
the burden of privilege tends to weigh heavily on a lot of these young people. Not all of them, you know, it's sometimes to, to give a talk, you have to give generalizations. They can be quite compliant and obedient until the day they announce trans identification. They can be a very obedient type who follows the rules and um, doesn't have, often hasn't found their strong voice and they find their strong voice through a trans identification, socially mediated, as I've mentioned before, in conditions such as ASD, ADHD, OCD, anxiety, disordered eating patterns and trauma. So they're common features. They're not always, I'm not saying they're always, I'm saying they're notable um, features. So as I said, key influencing factors would be things like anime, deviant art, Tumblr, Reddit, Discord, YouTube videos. Some of the YouTube videos are incredibly influential. The peer group, very often there's a cheerleading female friend groups. That might arrive after. They might have spent an awful lot of time online and the female friend group might arrive after that are cheerleading. And they've found their, they've found their world in a way. They can be very strong media influences. There's a huge glamorization of, um, of um, the trans identity. And which is great that they are, we are kind of living in a world where everybody's accepted to be who they were, are. But it's very important that um, there's lots of ways to be edgy. There's lots of ways to be yourself. And that like we could, I'd love to live in a world where boys could wear dresses, where, where it's just not that big a deal. But at the moment, it does feel really quite um, confining, especially for boys with gender expression. It's very often well-meaning, encouraging, and I would argue quite a misinformed adults and LGBTQ workshops and seminars can sometimes bring about um, a, a very keen interest in gender. And that can move into a very strong online presence. 